Right. Let's get started with the good now, if everyone's ready. So, yeah, so, so yeah, today's binary exploitation, also known as pwn or memory corruption, it revolves around, you know, essentially challenges in which it's different from reverse engineering in that you can't actually modify the contents of the programs, but what you can do is you can analyze how the program's functions and try to craft very clever, cleverly crafted inputs to make the program do what it's not supposed to do. So, yeah, as I said, yeah, what is binary exploitation? You are getting applications that behave in a way that is advantageous to you. So you want to be able to alter the code, code flow of a program, basically getting, code, getting a program to do stuff it was intended to do. That could, that could involve maybe uh, bypassing license checks in a um, program or getting it to do other things that it's not expected to do, unintended actions. A very, very, very common called, um, thing, thing of research in binary exploitation is a topic called privilege escalation. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the um, program pseudo, you know, the one where you type pseudo and give you administrative privileges. Uh, a while ago, um, there was a vulnerability found in pseudo that was actually a binary exploitation related um, vulnerability that let anyone uh, get uh, root access to a machine and not just the administrators. The way that worked is by providing cleverly crafted inputs that could allow it to bypass the, um, uh, the checks input in place because pseudo wants to know they um, set you up a okay, bit binary, which means that when you execute it, the program gets executed as a, as a root user rather than the uh, user that's currently logged in. So vulnerabilities in CUID binary um, programs are particularly useful. And a more recent version of that is going to be the PK exec vulnerability, which came out, I believe, about a month ago. And I guarantee at least half of the computers in this room are vulnerable to PK exec because it's, if you haven't touched it very recently, it's still very new. I checked my computer a while ago and it was vulnerable. It's um, very common. Um, yeah. And as I think, I think I've put a few of them here. Yeah. PK exec and pseudo, as I mentioned, but Eternal Blue is also another vulnerability that was a result of binary exploitation. Now, Eternal Blue was the vulnerability that resulted in the WannaCry ransomware attack. And it was actually, a, it came out because it was leaked by the Americans, because the NSA actually had a list of their own vulnerabilities that they kind of kept hidden from the public, that they used their own private means. But then it got leaked in the end. Funny story, Microsoft actually patched it a month before it was released. So either Microsoft happened to find out about it just before the public did, or the NSA kind of tipped off Microsoft knowing it was going to get leaked at some point. Either way, pretty scary. So the idea is you need to know that novel exploits revolve around binary exploitation quite often, especially the more important ones, and sometimes it can't always revolve around there being an existing exploit module. So understanding how these work is important. Additionally, as a program, like you can't really prevent these vulnerabilities if you don't understand how they work. If your program C faults, maybe you have to think to yourself, well, what does that mean? That could be a vulnerability. That could be my sloppy code just, you know, crashing, or maybe that could be a sign that someone can get remote code execution on my server if they can provide inputs to this program. Who knows? It's important to know the scope of what can be done. The first thing you need to keep in mind is um, binary revolves around the most important concept is the idea of memory layouts. So it's important to understand how memory works. Now, um, if you've taken a FIT2100 operating system, it's probably take, you probably understand how it works in a bit more depth, but idea, the idea is that every single program has its own uh, virtual memory space, which is slightly different to the entire memory space that the computer has for itself. And there are different segments. For example, the kernel virtual memory in kernel text and data, this is basically memory reserved for the kernel that's not really supposed to be Actually, I'm probably butchering my explanation. Uh, I don't know exactly what it's for, but, you, but the text, data, heap, and stack are the four most important segments that you will be dealing with 99% of the time. The text segment is what um, uh, your code is stored in. It's quite, um, uh, for example, when you compile your code, the actual um, uh, machine code is stored in the text segment, um, and that's where the instructions are made. So, the EIP register or the register that um, keeps track of where you're executing currently will more often than not point to the text section. The data section is used for um, static variables. Um, basically, most of the time it's for information that is known at the time that the program is compiled. So static information, um, kind of, yeah, global variables and stuff. Now the heap is where it gets, I'll say a little bit scary. Um, the heap is um, the dynamic memory. And it's um, when you call functions like a malloc, calloc, um, and other things like that. And also in C++, if you use like the new keyword. And generally when you, when you, when you need the data, um, that if the size of the data you need is only known at runtime rather than compile time, more often than not, more likely than not, you're gonna be using the heap. 
And the stack is where um, we're mostly going to deal with today. Because heap exploitation is a topic we've covered before, but it's very complicated. And to be honest, it's really scary. So I'm not going to touch any of it today. So the stack, so the stack is a um, data structure that stores most of the memory um, that is that we care about for the time being. And so the stack is a data type. So, so quick overview of registers. Um, one of the things that a CPU has is several different registers. Uh, actually, show of hands quickly. Does anyone is anyone here? Who here is familiar with assembly? Who here has looked at some kind of assembly before? It doesn't matter if it's MIPS or x86 or ARM or whatever. Yeah. That's great because that's that's really going to help. Because um, if you've taken MIPS, um, one of the good things about MIPS is that MIPS doesn't actually have push and pop instruction, which means you've got to modify the stack frames itself, which is a bit of a pain for the developer, but it means you have a good understanding of how stack frames work, which is quite useful. So yeah, registers are small bits of information in the CPU that can small, store small bits of data. Um, well, uh, typically the word size of the CPU you're using. That's typically 32 bits or 64 bits. Most of the time, I assume most of the computers here are 64 bits, um, but today we're going to be dealing with 32 bit programs. And the reason is that um, uh, modern CPUs typically have a compatibility mode that let you run 32 bit applications on 64 bit machines because um, actually the 32 bit registers are actually the 32 uh, most um, less significant bits of a, of a larger 64 bit register. So, yeah, in x86, there are um, this many registers the EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, ESI, and EDI are what are called general purpose registers. You can kind of store whatever you want in them. There are conventions, of course. For example, um, EAX is um, what's known as the accumulator register. And um, so I'll start all standing out of the way. EAX is the accumulator register, and by convention, typically stores return values of functions. So when a function returns, whatever it returns is stored in AAX, whether it's the value itself or a pointer to the value if it's something larger than the word size of the CPU. Um, yeah, and then, then the other ones, EBX through EDI, are commonly used to store um, um, arguments when calling some functions, depending on the calling convention. Don't worry about the time being. But EBX, ESP, and EIP are the really important ones. They are reserved. They have, they have very special purposes. They store the base pointer of the current stack frame, the stack pointer for the top of the stack frame and the instruction point of the kind of piece of code being executed, but I'll get to that later. Also, just a quick minute. Um, this can be quite a complicated topic. This confused the hell out of me for the longest amount of time. So um, um, if anyone gets confused or has a question or wants me to slow down at any point, please just yell out or raise your hand or send a mess send message on Zoom or do something. I don't want to confuse anyone or go too fast or anything. So please just let me know if there's something that doesn't make sense. So the important thing is that the stack is a, um, a first step, a last in, first out data structure. The only two operations you can make onto a stack are by pushing something onto the top of the stack from a register typically or from another area of memory or by um, popping something from the stack. You can't take elements directly out of the middle of the stack because the whole thing will tumble over metaphorically and you can't insert items into the bottom of the stack. You can only add to the top. And keep in mind how the um, earlier when we mentioned that the heap grows downwards, and so I'll skip back a little bit. As you can see, um, to maximize useful memory, the heap grows downwards and the stack grows upwards. And that's important to know because the stack, um, higher elements on the stack counterintuitively have low memory addresses. So as you add more and more items to the stack, every item on that stack has a, a, has a memory address that points to it. And as the stack gets larger, the top elements on the stack have lower addresses. So this element up here would have a lower address than this element here, which would have a higher address, and so on. Now, whenever a function, now one of the hallmarks of um, uh, modern programming allows for um, kind of recursive function calls is that every single function has, or every single instance of a function has its own local variables. That means that's why you're allowed to call, have a function that calls itself recursively, because each instance of the function or a function has its own local variables, even if it's the same function. And so every single time a function is called, it has its own stack frame here, which stores all its local variables. And so fun two, fun, fun two, fun one, fun three, uh, these are all different functions. And each stack frame, the stack frame currently in use um, has to, uh, um, the, param the bounds of the current stack frame being used are determined by what's known as the um, stack pointer, which keeps, which, which um, points to the top of the stack, and the base pointer, which points to the bottom of the stack. Yep. Now, I'm just going to go through an example piece of code um, that you might see in the binary exploitation challenge, show you the associated um, assembly instructions 
there any questions? Or? Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, so I'm going to show you a, I'm going to step through a, <laughs> that's all good. I'm going to step through a quick challenge here. Now, this is a vulnerable function. I'll explain why it's vulnerable a bit later on, but here is just a, the main function calls a bulk function, and this bulk function, it stores about, it, it determines, it allocates space for a integer value, a four character buffer, sets value equal to 42, takes input to the buffer, um, um, to the buffer, and then returns that value. Um, yeah. So the first thing it does is when main here, when the when code execution is main, or in practice, what that means is when the EIP register is pointing to the assembled instruction that allocate that is somewhere in main, uh, when I can call invalid, uh, this is what the stack frame looks like. The stack pointer is here, uh, the base pointer is somewhere down here. We're not worrying about the stack frame for main because we're dealing with how and how the stack frame changes once uh vulnerable is called called. Yeah, so data below the current stack frame is assumed to be junk. In practice, we can assume a lot more about it when you get some more complicated things, um, but we'll deal with other stack frames later on, or probably on a different day, to be honest. And so the first thing it does is um, the main function, uh, when it calls ESP, it saves the current base pointer so that it can be restored later. So it does the instruction push EVP, which means to um, move the stack, to decrement the stack pointer, and then uh, push the current value within the base pointer to the stack so that it can be restored later. Then the next thing it does is um, it um, does an instruction called move EBP ESP. So whatever value is stored in ESP, it moves it into the base pointer into EBP, which essentially means to set the base pointer to the stack pointer. I'm going to figure out the way so people can actually see what's going on here. So it sets the base, the base pointer to the value of the stack pointer to essentially initialize a new empty stack frame that has no value in it. And so, and then does call bomb. Now in x86, uh, it's a complex um, instruction set. So a lot of instructions here actually do several things. Um, so call bomb is the same as saying uh, push EIP. So put the current instruction pointer. So, or, or more specifically, the, the instruct, the, uh, 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 reference to the instruction directly after the call. So basically where the code will jump back to after this function are called, it returns. It pushes that pointer to the stack and then it sets the current instruction pointer to um, the start of the bond function. Now the bond function, the first thing it does is it does sub ESP8, which um, sets aside eight bytes of memory for local variables within the stack. Now keep in mind, this assembly is simplified slightly if you run it through GUB, it will look slightly different. Um, there's alignment issues and all kinds of stuff, but I'm just ignoring a lot of that. There's other calls you don't have to worry about. This is just a general overview. So it does sub ESP8, so it subtracts A from ESP to make more room between in the current stack frame for local variables. And does move um, 42 to ESP plus four. So if you imagine that this is this value here is pointed to by um, or dereferenced by ESP plus zero, and this is ESP plus four. So the value 42 is then moved into this address, which is where the uh, which is where the value variable is kind of assumed to be stored. Then does it then now there's the call to get s, which is a bit more complicated. It basically does the same thing the main does. I'm gonna skip over a lot of it, you know, it does the same stuff. Uh, it moves um, moves the stack pointer into e ESP. Um, that's sorry, no, it moves um now ESP stores the value of um, uh, the uh, the address of get s. Um, because now get s, this is a leak function. There are a few other calling conventions that are simplified. I'm just going to skip over what this does because it'll make three all stack frames on top and make system calls on top of that. But ultimately, all we care about is that when get s returns, it will have written whatever input the user put into the system, put, um, entered into this char buffer here. And let's just say they entered, let's just assume they entered four characters a, 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 a. So that's saved onto there first. And then next thing it does is it needs to return. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the EAX register is the um, register by convention that um, stores the return value of functions. So it says move um, dereferencing ESP plus four into EAX. In mind, this is ESP plus four, or the memory address um, uh, that points to this area. So that's moved into EAX. Then it does add ESP8. So now that the function is about to return, we can we don't need these local variables anymore. We can just completely delete them or um, Let's pretend they don't exist. Add ESP plus eight, add ESP to wipe the stack frame and then return. Now again, return um, uh, does several things. It's 
So it does um it does like um pop um EIP. So the value currently on the stack here is taken off the stack by um uh, adding to the stack pointer, and that value is set to the instruction pointer. So the instruction pointer that was here, so the the line of code that was here is now that what the code is pointing to. So it goes back to here. So the function vol returned a value of 42, and then it resumed execution in the main function. Are there any questions about that or any things people are confused about? Or? So I'll keep going. But now you might, know, you might wonder, what exactly is the um, vulnerability here? Well, the idea is that in C, not all functions are um, secure. In fact, quite a lot of them are insecure. You, you know that because if you try to compile this program just using GCC without using any warning suppressions, just using normally, um, you'll get like several different warnings. The compiler will tell you it's depreciated, but then even the linker, LD, will start to tell you it's dangerous and this should not be used. Like you can't get more clear than that. This is a very vulnerable function to use. As a matter of fact, I actually had to say, okay, use the C99 standard because in more recent um, versions of C, GetS is just downright removed and it's, and it's very difficult to actually include. So you can definitely tell that GetS is quite vulnerable and shouldn't be used. But why is it vulnerable? What is actually the problem here? Does anyone have an idea what the vulnerability here might be or why this might be a bad thing? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, yeah, now I'm, I'm mostly trying to teach the people that aren't in the Monset committee. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you know how this works. <laughs> yeah, no. no. So the idea is that getS doesn't check boundary conditions. It only had a single argument, which was a memory address. It didn't say read four bytes from the user. It just said read from the user until you get a um, null byte to signify the end of the string. So what would happen if you entered more than four bytes? You could start overriding other values in the stack. You could override other local variables. You could overwrite registered sa registers saved on the stack, including return addresses and base pointers. And you could over also overwrite previous data on previous stack frames. And this is all pretty bad. By overriding local variables, you could, um, uh, by overriding local variables, you can just completely change what they are just by taking input. Uh, by overriding in instruction pointers, this is where it gets interesting because keep in mind that this here is what say is, um, this area memory here is where, is where the, um, code note is, is how the program knows where to resume execution when the function returns. So if you can overwrite this, you can basically say, okay, when the function returns, instead of jumping back to the caller, why don't you just jump to this function instead? Like I prefer that function. And uh, you can obviously, and so that's redirecting code execution. Or as you'll see in some of the demos I'll do, um, if overriding local variables, you can change conditions. Like if there's some program that says, you know, admin equals zero, if admin equals one, do something else, do that. But if you can just change, whether you're an admin or not, then that could do a big thing. That could do something very vulnerable, which is essentially a very simplified version of what the pseudo vulnerability was a while ago. You can also overwrite data on previous stack frames, but that's a bit beyond the scope of today's workshop. Um, if you're interested in the vulnerabilities of overwriting the previous stack frame, you can look into a technique called um, uh, return-oriented programming, which is the modern form of this, because as I mentioned, the compiler screams at me when I try to compile this, so you can tell there's a lot of modern uh, memory protection things that you have to get around to do this on modern system. So let's do a quick demo. I'm going to show you some other things, like I'm going to show you the effects of overriding local variables. Or I, just realized I forgot to release today's challenges. Can we go do that? They're on the, they're on the CTF there. Oh, yeah, can you do that? Yeah. So, while, yeah, so, I'm, so while, while they release the challenges, I'm going to do a quick few quick, uh, quick demos to show you the tools. So overriding local variables, jumping to other functions, and jumping to custom shell code. Sure. Now, using Kylie, because I'm an epic hacker. Now, can people see this right? I'll make it a little bit bigger. Is this big enough for everyone? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, sure. So. So, um, so here's the first program we've got. Now this program is essentially the same as the program I showed you before. The only difference is that instead of just returning the values, main, main prints out the value so you can see what it was. And it's uh, pretty straightforward. So as you can see, if I just do, if I execute program main, it asks me for an input, so I'll put in the A, and then it prints out 42 because 42 is the value here uh, that it's stored and then returned later on. But you might wonder what will happen if I put in more than four bytes? What if I, whatever happened, what if I just put in an absolute ton of them? What if I put in, say, 
uh, put in like six or seven. Can anyone guess what's going to happen here? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if I run this, it's going to print out what's this? 6,381,921, which seems like a completely arbitrary number. Why is why do I get that number just by writing A's a bunch of times? So it'll make more sense if you check the hex value of this of this number. Hex 616161. And if you check the character code of six one, this is the letter A. So as you can see, we've just overwritten A's into the other variable. And so we can just by, con by controlling this a little more carefully, we can essentially just set that variable to be whatever value we want, as long as we can know the boundaries of it. Now, just a quick trick question that actually confused me a bit while I was setting up this demo. What will happen if I enter exactly four, um, exactly four A, because keep in mind the buffer is four characters long. Does anyone know what would happen here? Yep, do you know, do you know what it would Yeah, exactly. You got that about 20 minutes quicker than I got it. <laughs> Yeah, it returns zero because get s actually um, returns one extra byte because in C, um, strings are just arrays of characters with a zero byte or a null byte at the end to signify that the string has um, ended. So what is the, um, so you can set this to be whatever you want really. And uh, there's a few challenges on the CTFD that um, I'll be getting people to kind of have a look at later on to see how it works. But um, yeah, so um, you can basically, you can, yeah, so if you if you print raw, if you can imagine if you do some echo raw bytes, you can do echo dash e a bit c dash e c then some uh, you can see if you're using the echo command, you can print out raw bytes here, and then if you print that, if you pipe that into main. It was set to 65226, which is is um I did the wrong. Don't worry, I'll, I'll worry about that later. There are there are, there are better tools you can use later on. Uh, the live demo gods are you know, uh, very tricky to appease. Live demos are very scary always. So here's a second program. This program is a bit more interesting um, because instead of just overwriting a random uh, variable, we can actually, I'm going to actually give you a demo of how redirecting code execution would work. Now this function here, this program here, main called fun, nothing perfect here, defines a 16 byte buffer. It asks you for your name, uh, you put in your name and it greets you and then it returns back here. But what if for some reason we really want to call this function? Now this function is called unreachable and there are no calls to this function. So in theory, according to like you know static code analyzers, there should be no way to reach this function. But you're part of Monset, you know better. So let me show you how that would work. But now this is the first actual tool you'll be using, which is GDB, which is one that hopefully you installed beforehand. So now I'm gonna have a look at um. So if you're if you open file using GDB, yeah. Now I've installed um PwnGDB, so yours will look slightly different from mine with a bit more tools. So I highly buy installing PwnGDB, but I'm not gonna be using any additional advanced functionality. So you can just do this with vanilla GDB. So you can disassemble, see this. Okay, basically the main function, uh, you know, initializes the stack frame, calls the function, function uh, returns zero and leaves, nothing unexpected there. The vulnerable function, it's a bit more, you know, like this, a little bit smaller. Can you still see that okay? Yeah, so um, you can see the, uh, stuff here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this. Uh, I'm going to kind of debug this dynamically because GDB is a debugger. It's not. It's not just for doing binary exploitation. I actually, I actually um, had a really interesting realization uh, last year when I used GDB for debugging purposes and realized, wow, this is actually really good for debugging. I forgot that it wasn't just for CTS. <laughs> yeah. So you can set a breakpoint at say break uh, long plus. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break just after the call to get s call to get s um, uh, long plus 41 and then run the program. So it's going to ask me what is my name? My name is Leo. So it's going to say, I'm just going to quickly run this. Yeah. 
that is the things in program is asked if you name Leo is out hello Leo. But if you run if you run say, the name, my name is you know 50 billion A's. It says hello, it's it says hello, it screams if you can crash it. So um you might you can kind of expect that by entering way more character than it was predicting, then something will crash. But what specifically is it that's crashing? Like why did this crash exactly? We can debug this in GDB by um by running again, entering the same input you ran before. My name is 50 billion A's. Now if we check here, um, I'm currently uh, in Uh, I'm currently right here after the call to get us. If I check, um, if I check, um, if I check, if I check the value of the stack frame, these are here, few values here. Um, but then 616161, this has been just written to the entire stack and it's overwritten other stuff below the frame, like way more than expected. And so by doing info frame, you see that the, the saved DIP value, the saved stack, the saved um, pointer. Um, is hex 61, which is just a nonsense value. It's, you're going to get a safe fault because that's not an area of memory that's supposed to be executing from. So, of course, if you continue by running pressing C, um, you'll get invalid address 61. This is the part of the, yeah, you'll just get, you know, the segmentation fault as you can expect. But what let's say, I don't want to jump to, so I just, I don't want to crash the program. I want to jump to somewhere else. I want, so you can know, Should I click the wrong one? <laughs> uh, no, this is still this is still running in memory. I just gotta do this quickly. <laughs> so, um, so I'm gonna import pony tools. Without this, of course. Sorry, oh, no. okay. So what I want to do is I want to find out exactly how many bytes do, can I use before I start overriding stuff. And so in print tools, there's a really cool tool called Cyclic. So if I do Cyclic 100, it will generate a 100 characters I can use. And if I enter, oops, no, that's crashed. Let me see if I can remember how I can file this. Um, you know, I'll come back to this challenge later, maybe. So, yeah, different challenge that I can find the same. That's very convenient. Yeah. We generate a hundred by characters here. Uh, And I'm going to enter this long string here. So here, the state, the stack is, stack is being overwritten by a this pattern here. But because it's repeating, you can look at this pattern and see exactly what the offset is. So I'm going to do say, okay, that pattern happened exactly 28 characters in. So I will say, okay, first I want to do first I want a, a buffer of 28 random characters. So I'll say buffer. I'm using Python 2, by the way, it's uh, much better for binary exploitation. Uh, because you can print more bytes in it without having to mess around with other libraries. So I'll do buff 28. Then I will do buff plus equals. Um, I'm just going to say uh, one value that I can use is the string hex dead beef because you can print it in hexadecimal and it's immediately recognizable. Hex D. And then, of course, print the buff. I always forget to print it and wonder why it doesn't work. I run it with um, this. Uh, so here, the, um, this, the, the instruction pointer is set to what a value that looks to be like dead beef. It's, it's organized in a really weird way. Does anyone, can anyone guess why this value isn't exactly what we'd expect it to be? Yeah, exactly. It is little, this program uses a uh, little endingness. Uh, but if you use a program check set, it 
you can see here that it is um, a, a 32 byte, a 32 bit little Indian program. And so um, with, within every word, um, the bytes within it are organized uh, back to front, which I swear it just exists to annoy people and give me an extra interesting point to mention during these workshops. So what you have to do is you have to structure this to say EF, um, uh, the EAD. But the thing is, Prince also has a program that a function that automatically corrects for this called P32. We call or it's called P64 if you're doing a 64 bit byte pro program to so type in the hex value. I'll run it again using that. And you can see, it's what we expect. Now, if we continue like normal, as you can, as, as you can expect, extend if is not a valid in memory. In memory, but we need to find okay, what is the actual address in memory we want to jump to? You can use GDB to do this by saying, you know, uh, uh, what's the name of the program again? We can use object dump. It's called unreachable, that's right. So if you do object dump. This is the memory address of it. Hex. This is hex, by the way, so hex 0804. This is quite a low address. You can tell it's part of the um, uh, text section because it's quite low because it was towards the top of the layout. So you can pull the slides. So you like that. Now, what we want to do is we want to run, run it again using that kind of custom. In, no, sorry, I didn't actually type it in right. So I'm muted in. I've been using it for about two years. Um, or GDP is the other way to do it. So just copy the hex string directly through here. Make sure to press I before I type the hex string. Now, if you run it, uh, you can see that um, continue. As you can see, it is printed. You win, meaning I call unreachable. So now, now we've done the GDB, we want to do it without the debugging interface, but sometimes with um, more advanced questions, like ones involving memory addresses, it can be a bit difficult to do Python. Python is You can see, as you can see, we've um, uh, called the unreachable function and we win. In a CTF, this function would usually uh, print a flag instead, but we win. So as you can see here, we've, so we've um, redirected code execution. And um, there's another demo I have here. Um, but I was thinking, um, yeah, let's see. This, this challenge here, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to go over it just yet. Um, I'd like to see how people are finding the other challenges first, maybe get people a chance to work on them on their own. And then maybe when people want to get past that, we'll have a look at this. Now, this challenge here is suspiciously similar to the Bank of Monsec challenge if you happen to be at the um, beginner CTF, and that is intentional. Um, because it's a slightly simplified version of that, and then I can do a demo of the um, Bank of Monsec challenge if you want to see a uh, version of this. Now, this challenge, um, no, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'll come back to this challenge a bit later, but I'll, I'll just say that this challenge involves shellcode. If you already know what that is, you can have a go at it, but if you don't, I'll probably have a go at this in a little bit after people have had a chance to work on the challenges throughout the moment. So, um, are the challenges released at the moment? Uh, yeah, right, so does everyone just want to work, work on those for a bit? Um, and I can just, and the community people can just walk around and see how you're going. And where are they? Oh, oh sorry, I should have mentioned that they're on the, yeah, they're on the um, ctf.monsec.io. Yeah, so CTF, so this is our CTFD platform where we, this is our CTF platform where we um, post our challenges for weekly workshops and let people kind of work on different things. So the, I'll give a quick, I'll just give a quick overview of the first challenge, just so you know how these categories to work, typical work. This is a very typical example. Uh, so this is a very typical example. They give you a netcat session, which is basically an IP address and a port that points to um, a, a foreign server that is running this program that lets you interact with it. And they also give you a local copy for desk team debugging purposes. So I'll download this here, say I'll save the binary and the source code. Sure. 
So the way this pro the, the way this challenge works here is that um, um this challenge works here is that um basically it gets you input a value here. Uh, it gets you to input some values stored into um, written into this buffer. Um, it sets change me the changing variable to zero. Pulls the s, and if the value is set to something other than zero, then it prints out the flag. Um, and if you haven't seen what struct is before, don't worry about that. It's just um, it's sometimes good to use structs in these things because it makes it more obvious which kind of um, order the variables are laid out in memory. Because sometimes a common protection in this category is that um. If, if the compiler notices that there's one area of memory that the user is writing to um, that could overwrite out the variables, they might keep that below all the other variables intentionally to try and stop that from overwriting other things. And so if you, use a, so if you use a struct, it makes it a bit more obvious that this is directly below in memory to this. Yeah. And so the idea here is that if you, um, I'll just do a demo of this one because it's dead simple. So if you, so if you do um, this one, Phase, value change hasn't been changed. If I put in enough, then oh, it's still enough. Let's do it. one minus the python, that's what they're, they're quite common. So there's a there's 70, that should be enough. Yep, so now catflag.txt, no such file directory, that's obvious because I don't have the flag at the moment. If I already had the flag, then the challenge would have been over. So the way you do this is they, once you've got it working locally, they give you a netcat session. Now netcat is a program that lets you kind of um, send your raw TCP bytes to and from a server. So it gives you this program to run netcat, an IP and then a port. So as you can see here, running the challenge lets you get this interface, but running netcat also gives you the exact same interface. But the difference is here, this binary is going to run on the server now. So if I use the exact same payload, but instead of typing into the binary, I plug it into a netcat session, it now prints out a flag. I'm going to clear the flag from here so people can copy it and let them work on themselves. But um, this is the command that I run around to get it so people want to kind of work on that. I'll give a quick break um, and come back to this in a little bit if anyone wants me to go any further or wants me to clarify any challenges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been trying to get out of the so I think it's all out of the summary. Would you be able to spot yourself maybe or do the VPN for years or it means yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, 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 And so the idea behind shellcode is that um sometimes if you've got if you vote if you can control the um 
uh, instruction pointer, if you write the buffers, you can override all of this. But let's say there's no magic function you can call that will keep make you do all everything you want. There's no um, there's no value you can overwrite to give you all that input because you want sometimes it's just a limit to how what can do. You want um what you want to do is you want to get full remote code execution. And sometimes the only way to do that is by doing something called shellcode injection. So if we go do challenge five, let's see. So this challenge here, the hint here is um, can you XMB bin slash sh? Now, one thing I probably should mention that I probably should have mentioned earlier is that I can't take um, uh, the credit for all these challenges. So I, I, I stole a few of them and modified them to make more sense for a CTF context, a CTF context from exploit.education, which I highly recommend you have a look at. It is probably the best learning resource out there, and I cannot recommend looking at this enough. Go to here, go to Phoenix. Uh, stack zero is um, uh, where it starts. It gets more complicated. Stack five is basically challenge five is modified from stack five, but I made it a bit easier by adding an extra variable to print out. And then there's like, then you can learn about format string vulnerabilities after that. Then you can look at heap vulnerabilities and some other common stuff, some other stuff there. And there are walkthroughs online you can look up. It's very useful. But anyway, I'll go back to what I was talking about before. The idea behind this challenge here calls, you know, so it's been a cool start level and exits. And this level just asks you to read to a buffer, um, uh, and then asks you to read to a buffer, and then this returns doing nothing. And this is a challenge, like, you know, in particular, the fact that you've got a very large buffer and that you've got um, nothing else to do, it kind of hints that, you know, you want shellcode practically. And essentially, when you, um, now, I've been, I've been stepping through assembly in the past, uh, earlier to kind of show you how machines interpret instructions. In practice, machines don't look at assembly. What, what we were looking at were kind of, uh, assembly mnemonics for uh, not codes that are um, kind of a, a human readable version of it. In practice, machines, they just read raw bytes. And so what you can do is in practice, um, if what if you could get code you wanted converted into raw bytes, write those raw bytes to the buffer, and then instead of jumping to some other function, you jump to that buffer and then execute those bytes from the buffer. So basically, if you can write the code you want, you can then jump to that code and execute it. Now, it's important to mention that on most modern systems, um, uh, compilers, if I'll check this up, we'll check sec, challenge five. Now, this, now, this, now another hint is that this has something called NX um, enabled, uh, disabled. Now, NX is the uh, non executable bit, I think. Yeah, so um, modern CPUs, they have something called um, uh, read X or write. That means um, basically, if there's an area of memory, if there's a segment of memory that you're allowed to write to, then you're not allowed to execute from it and vice versa. That's to stop that. That's kind of to stop this kind of um, uh, thing from happening. Now on that note, I actually got into a pretty lengthy argument with Marius about this last year, because I thought this was a very poor design for a CPU. In the thon the model, there should be no difference between data and things. And that being said, you can get around it anyway with return-oriented programming, but that's a topic for another time. Uh, yeah, so basically you can, this means that you can write, you can write shellcode and then jump to it. But the thing is, yeah, you need to, now, again, I've made it easier by inputting this line, but um, for the time being, I'm going to ignore that line. And if you want to challenge yourself when you get home, uh, you pretend this line doesn't exist. That line is just to stop you from wanting to jump out the window of the nearest skyscraper because when your shellcode doesn't work, um, it can be quite, shellcode is a bloody annoying thing to use because of, because the difference is while, um, now, X, now elf assembly, sorry, elf objects, which are basically, um, uh, what these executable things are. They have like symbol tables, which is what object dump reads to, to get you all the different addresses for different functions. But the difference is with um, uh, the difference is with um, uh, individual stack frame values is that um, uh, the difference is that values on the stack change on, depending on different things. Now, um, what I've mentioned here is that uh, as the first hint is that the challenge is running on a server with ASLR disabled. Now, ASLR is address space layout randomization. That basically means whenever you run a challenge, the stack addresses are going to be randomized each time. Because if you if your code says, okay, write this to the stack and then jump to this address on the stack, if the stack addresses are randomized each time, it makes it difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. There are ways to get around that, but it just makes it a bit more frustrating. So for the purpose of this challenge, I've disabled ASLR. And you can do that locally on your machine by running this command. Uh, so you just do run this root, then you can the password right. 
execute this, and that will decide why it's slow, and that's good because what's playing on this machine as well. Which I was thinking to as well. Yeah. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to kind of find out. I'll make a um, solution script as well. Now, the one thing that might be confusing is that um, when you're using JDB, the stack addresses will be the same every time. Uh, well, usually, and that's because JDB specifically, because JDB is a debugger and you want debugging experiences to be deterministic, um, it disables ASLR locally on the binary on a kind of uh, for its specific execution. Which is why, um, if you're running, if you write a, if you write shell code and it works on JDB, that's only the first step of the thing. You getting it to work outside of JDB is a whole other story. But luckily, because we've made disabled JS, J, um, we've disabled ASLR, it makes it a bit easier, but not perfect. Even with ASLR disabled, depend whether you're running on the server within JDB or just locally in your machine, the addresses can be slightly different. The reason is that um, when you're running a program, sometimes that program might want to read, say, um, environment variables, like path is a typical one, as well as other kinds of variables you might set. And the reason the different processes are able to read this is that when you load a program, um, all of those environment variables are kind of read into memory. And so those that takes up space kind of in different areas. And so you can imagine there'll be slightly different offsets. And so depending on where it's being executed, and GDB adds additional variables on there to um, uh, to um for its own debugging purposes. So the first thing we're going to do is, you know, unset, um, uh, is it, what is it? Sam, can you remember the command to uh, unset like lines and columns on JDB? Yeah. Well, I'm not going to bother about that now. Uh, again, that, I'm just going to use that line that made, you know, made it a bit easier. So the first thing you want to do is you want to find the... Um, I want to find the, um, I want to kind of find the uh, offset of the EIP register to kind of find where I can, uh, how many characters it takes to overflow it. So I'm just going to run it. Uh, I'm just going to run it. So instead of typing your program, I'm just going to write lift one. And you can see this large pattern is being written here. And it says invalid address this. This is what the Kind of thing is, and if I do stick with so this is what the offset is 140, which is about what we expect. So, just for the sake of making you see my video, I'm just going to make a comment here that says offset. So, we remember that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, what can we start to with the function here? Start level. Now, the first thing we want to do is we want to try and guess the address of the buffer. Now, I mean, in this case, uh, printf is telling you the address of the buffer for reasons I'll explain later, but the time being, because this, you're not going to see this, usually I want to pretend this line doesn't exist. So we want to sign what is the address of the buffer in this case. So if you look through the assembly, you can see, okay, where is the call to get s? Now the call to get s is made here. And the first thing I want to do is say, okay, um, uh, so when it's loading the, actually no, Please be honest, I'm just going to run it and check what we've done. So we'll break, so we'll break on get s. Uh, break. Um, it's been a while since it's challenged, so don't be surprised if I just completely stuff it up. So over here, and the call to get s is being made, and the first argument here is um, uh, this address here, which I'll just say, okay. So I'm making a note here. This. We know the offset is this, and it's the same object as this. Actually, no, this was, I can't be. I'm going to I'm just going to run it and double check what the, um, what the address it prints out is. Uh, 
Uh, actually, no, yeah, no, I got, I got the address right, yeah. So I'm just doubting myself a little bit. It's been a while since I've done this. Yeah, so we got the address of buffer. And instead of, usually we write, you know, A times whatever. The thing is now we want to try and find some shell code to write to write there instead. Um, and so you can generate the shell code yourself. Pwn Tools has lots of really useful functions in there for generating shell code. But for the sake of the argument, um, uh, Shellstorm is a web... Of course it's... <laughs> right, uh, I'm just going to copy some shell code from another challenge then. Oops. Yeah, that's not my computer. You know, the, um, the key combinations in i3 are very similar to the key combos on Windows. So running i3 in a VM inside a window is a recipe for disaster. Shell start storm. Uh, this shell code works. Um, I'm just going to copy this. But in practice, if you're not on an authoritarian network like this, you could just find the shell code yourself. So I'm just going to say. This. And so basically, if the computer executes all of these, um, if, it, if the ARP is set to something that executes all these, it executes in SH and gives you a shell. And so it executes. Looks like I prepared myself a little bit there. This. And the thing is, um, so what? So what you could do is just, you know, that's, you could just now if you knew exactly where you're writing to, you could just do buff plus equals show, and buff plus equals um, uh, a times buff. Say okay, print it out. You know, you know, pad the buff with enough until you're just behind the save pointer, and then say buff plus equals two thirty two. And that might work, but the thing is, you're going to deal with off by one errors, you can deal with random sort of things, and in practice doesn't work like that. So, um, because the thing is, if you jump to the shell code, if you skip the first byte and jump to the second byte in this shell code, keep in mind that you know, function this function probably has like a prologue and everything, and just sacrament and all kind of stuff. If you skip a single instruction, you're, you're going to have a bad time, it's going to do a lot of unpredictable stuff. Um, so what you like to do is you want to have a kind of uh, a frame is okay. I can, if I jump to anywhere in here, then it should work. The way you get around this is by using what's called a uh, knock sled. And because no one's watching online, I can draw a quick diagram. Uh, if, um, if right, so let's say, you know, right here is my um, shell code. So I, I'm executing from here, going down to here, and then and this is the, we override the ARP and we jump. Ideally, we would jump immediately to the shell code and start executing down. And once we get to the bottom, we get, you know, we get a rich shell or whatever kind of shell there is. But the thing is, because it's impossible to know, you want some kind of tolerance. You want to be able to jump to generally in this area because there's a lot of randomness. There's a lot of unpredictability and you want this to be as consistent as possible. So what you can do is you can have what's called a NOP sled. Now, NOP or NOOP or just NOP in x86 is an instruction that does nothing. If the, if the CPU executes NOP, um, it just, it's a debugging thing. You include it if you want to pad out the thing. And a lot, a lot of developers use NOP instructions if they know they might have to mine, if they know they might have to manually patch the binary later on. So what you can do is before the shell code, you just include a really large, um, you, you just include a really large NOP sled ahead of it. So it doesn't matter whether you jump to here, whether you jump to here, whether you jump to here, because once you hit anywhere in here, you just immediately go down and start executing, and then you hit this, execute this shell code, and it works. And so what you can do is, is define a few important things. So I'll delete what I've got here so far. And so I'll define the address, I'll define the shell code, there's a few other things I like to define. So I'll say, okay, knock equals, now the hex instruction for knock is hex 90. And there's also another one. Uh, if you're curious, the way that these debuggers work is that once, is that when you say, okay, I want to set a breakpoint right here, then the instruction sort of that address is um, replaced with the instruction for a, um, a, a debugging breakpoint or, a, or a, the instruction that calls a SIG trap, which is what's used for debugging. And so that's called the int three, or I'll just call it int. The interrupt is, is um, x, uh, cc. Um, and I just like to replace um, while you're debugging with shell code using in three in, in place of shell code is just an RG, the way to get working. 
So you say, okay, not equals this. So instead of using A to cut it, I'm just saying buff equals B equals, buff equals uh, say, buff times, uh, let's just say, and say buff plus equals. Um, now, instead of the shell, you couldn't do the shell code here to say buff plus equals um, times 23, because I think that's how long the shell code is. And then buff plus equals, you want to pad it out with um, Now, you know, I'll just do int times buff to 140 minus length of buff. So the length of the buffer up until this point, so buff. Plus equals the address. I can almost certainly guarantee it's going to work the first try because that's just how these are sometimes. And writing shellcode live is probably the most daunting task it's possible to do. Uh, so I'll run this. Yep, so you can see the program received a sig trap sig trace breakpoint trap. So if you say, um, okay, let's say um, x slash um, x um, ESP minus 20. You can see here, okay, this is, um, I'll print out 100. So, you know, uh, minus 20, yeah. So this is um so this is the stack from the um uh, so this is a thing of the stack as you can see all there here are all of the um actually no what I do that's good but uh as you can see so what's ha essentially happening here is that this address is uh this it's jumping to this address which is then hitting the not sled then hitting one of the interrupt things and going to here so now that we know that the shell code is working in theory I can replace this line, like this with the knob sled, and say, okay, buff plus equals shell code, buff plus equals. Um, no, what I prefer to do actually is have the shell code towards the end. So buff plus equals knob times, sorry, 140 minus length shell code. Buff shell code. That should work in theory, I think. Let's try that again. What we do is I'm set a breakpoint on get s. Plus 41. You can see here. Um, so yeah, so it's the instruction pointer is currently at the call get it hasn't been made yet, and then it's going to be called the rest of start level. Then after that calls at the moment, the function the debug, debug thinks we're going to jump back to main and it's keep executing. But what if we step a single instruction up call it to uh, get s after the input has been given? As you can see here, then immediately instead it's jumped into a stack address. Now generally you can identify a stack addresses because they start with hex ff and it's just calling these not instructions. So as we call here, we're stepping through. And we got a seg bolt, and of course we did. Um, uh, Sam, do you have any idea what I did wrong here? Yeah, because I definitely did the notch there. Right. Yeah. It's in, it's in, but I'm setting for a moment now. I'm now hit the knob slide. Yeah, I'll make it a lot bigger. That's some, probably sound good. Oh, actually, no, the knob slide should be. Um, yeah, 
PV in Oxlade is um, quite substantial. So here's yeah. what we're looking at. Yeah. Well, to be honest, this is 99% of the experience of shell code. You know it works in theory, but you're spending a lot of time debugging it. And, you know, it's it's slightly adventurous to do shell code live because I know it never works. Um, I mean, I sold this afternoon because I wrote a bloody thing, and so I know it all works in theory, but it's going on. I'll probably get a solution stage somewhere. You know what, I might just leave this as an exercise for the reader. This is a hint. <laughs> yeah, this is purely intentional. Maybe it's your job, isn't it? There's a reason it's worth only points because it's, I don't know, I, I just hate shellcode. <laughs> it's annoying. But I, don't, but I don't know Rob, so I have no alternative but to use it until. Yeah, go on. Yeah. I just can't wait for, for Ari or Sam or someone to give a Rob um, workshop so I can actually learn how that mystical dark art works. <laughs> So, so you're I'll not aware. Today, but yeah, yeah, it's probably a bit late at the moment. Maybe. Late also, would it be too? It might be a bit daunting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> would it be too early to do one next week? You reckon? Or? No, that's not too early. I mean, I'll prepare to do it. Yeah. Well, that being said, uh, Omri did say he might be prepared to do it next week. I'm not sure. Maybe. Might. Uh, you, uh, yeah. Well, I'm not member training officer anymore, so it's not my responsibility <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. Go sort them out amongst yourselves a bit. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, maybe we'll stop the recording. I don't think there's any.